Till it is complete 
typical dream a few years of marriage and then kids healthy happy normal kids you always think when you get married and it's time to have kids that getting pregnant is going to be no big deal because it's time um, and we had a little bit of trouble with that so it took a while before we were able to get pregnant my name is Rachel Smith and I've been a part of this church pretty much my whole life and I get to tell you the story of the night that God saved my life I was living in Roseman, and um, I've been working here at the church for about 12 years now. So this was in 2009, and um, October 15th, I was coming to church just for a meeting, um, a typical evening meeting, and um, I came to a stop sign, and I had to choose whether I was going to turn left or right. Right would take me on the freeway, left would take me kind of through town to get to the church. And I remember sitting there praying and just asking God, what way should I go? Because I like to change it up. I only have two choices. So I asked him which direction I should, I should take. And I, I really felt that he said to turn left, which meant I wasn't going to go on the freeway. So for us, it was a little bit of a struggle to get to the place where we got pregnant. Um, we had a few medical issues, and so it took us a little bit longer to get pregnant than we had hoped. So we had a normal, healthy pregnancy, had Joseph. Um, when he was about two, um, we got pregnant again. Um, we had another miscarriage. Um, after that miscarriage, um, once again, within a couple of months, we were able to get pregnant again. And the whole pregnancy up until the very end seemed very happy, healthy, normal. We had another boy. Um, and when he was born, everything was perfect. He came out screaming. 
Um, nothing wrong with him. He was a very happy, content child in the beginning. I had worship music playing in the car and I was just preparing myself for the meeting with staff and, um, and just heading to church, minding my own business. So the first time we noticed something was wrong was when we took Micah to one of his pediatrician appointments. Um, he was about two months old and we were just going in for the standard vaccines, well baby check. At that point, the pediatrician noticed he wasn't hitting one of his milestones. And in that moment, everything changed. Um, the first thing that I remember was seeing headlights coming right at me. The next thing I remember, I was waking up. And that's when everything changed. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, as as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it. And he'll immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did just as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him, threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. And others cut down branches from the trees, and they spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession. And the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Palm Sunday is today. And it's a day where we have an opportunity to join a praise party. It's a day where we commemorate the story of this historic praise party, but you should know that it's also the beginning of a week-long time of confusion, betrayal, pain, rejection. You see, the Jewish expectation for the coming Messiah or the coming Savior was for a conquering king Right? He, he was the one who was prophesied to come riding in on a donkey, and, and, and he was going to then be the all-powerful king of the Jews, riding in on a donkey? Check. So when this, this crowd saw him riding in exactly like that, this spontaneous praise party erupts, and we're throwing down palm fronds and throwing our suit coats down on the street. Because they expected that he was going to go in and challenge the Roman oppressors. And what he actually did was this. It says, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came into the temple and he healed them. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children in the temple shouting, praise God for the son of David. You see, they were out in the streets and they learned this new worship song. And they weren't allowed to come in and make a ruckus in the temple. Jesus comes in and all the rules go out the window. And these kids are there singing, praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indignant. They asked Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? Yes, Jesus replied. 
haven't you even read the scriptures? For they say, you have taught children and infants to give you praise. Then he returned to Bethany, where he stayed overnight. You see, their expectation was for a king to overthrow the Roman rule. But when Jesus walked into the temple, for Jesus and for the people in the city of Jerusalem, that was the moment when everything changed. This Palm Sunday, we want to invite you to go on a journey with us. Will you stand as we sing another worship song today?
You guys may have a seat. diagnosed with low muscle tone. Um, little did we know that when he had turned right around six months old, um, he actually went into an episode of choking where he turned blue while he was sitting in my lap. We took him into the emergency room and we realized that at that point he had one completely collapsed lung and the other lung was full of atelectasis, which is just like mucus. I, I was scared. Um, I had never experienced a child choking. I didn't know what was going on. And I didn't understand like the gravity of that moment. He was transferred up to Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital where they were able to um, provide us with the people that knew what was going on. So we had a neurologist that took one look at him and with what he had going on, they knew, they knew exactly what Micah's diagnosis was, which Micah has spinal muscular atrophy type one. His nerves in his spinal cord do not connect to the nerves in his body. Um, he's missing the gene that makes the protein that allows the two to connect. So his brain is completely perfect, but it's just not relaying the message up to his body parts. So all of his muscles are weak. When I woke up, I I knew that I knew I had hit something, and I realized that I was facing the wrong direction on the road that I had been going. I had been going east, and I was now facing west. And my arms felt funny, and I knew I had been in an accident. And I was going to reach for my phone to call somebody, and my arm was crooked, like it went this way and it bent down, and then my hand continued. And I, I remember looking at my arm and thinking, oh, it's broken. The only thing that happened on the inside of my car was the volume knob on the radio had come off, but the radio was still playing. So I still had my worship music. I could look around. I saw the, the car that hit me. It was off in the ditch and um, I could see the top of the man's head. And I, all I could see was dark hair. So I thought I was a young person driving this car. and. And I remember praying for that person. I, I didn't know if he was okay or, or what had happened. And this person had just jumped out of oncoming traffic right into me. And somehow we managed to spin around and end up where we were without hitting anybody else, which is a miracle. And it was about an hour before the paramedics came to work on me. They were focused on the other driver. And I just sat there singing and praying and and choosing joy in the midst of it because there's there wasn't another option. I didn't find out a lot of details about the other driver until a couple of days later. After I had surgery, uh, someone came to visit me and, and let me know that he actually passed away. For whatever reason, was suddenly in my lane. But nobody really knows. Um, so we went from, you know, happy, healthy, normal, um, within a matter of hours to um, we were in the hospital for 30 consecutive days while all that was happening I was kind of taking the mr. mom side and we I mean we had an older you know we had Joe still trying to keep keep things going at, at work um, feeling disconnected from what she was doing on a day-to-day -day basis in there while I was trying to do the day-to-day -day stuff to keep our life moving forward um, that was another kind of emotional aspect of it that was tough to kind of navigate. Um, and all the while trying to figure out like what, what does life now look like moving forward? Um, this is not, this is not the picture that we had in our heads of what we were going to be doing for the next what, however many years. Um, so what does this new, this new life feel and look like? All the hopes we had kind of in that moment too crashed. Because, you know, you think about, you know, your kids walking and talking and, you know, running up and hugging you and having their first words be mom and dad. And here we have 
our son, who we love dearly, is probably never going to say mom or dad. You know, may not. At this point, they told us he wasn't even going to live to be past six months. So you're taking your almost six month old child who they're saying isn't gonna live to be six months. And if he lives to six months, he definitely won't make one year. And so taking that home, um, it, I mean, it was devastating. Um, you have to like try to pack a lifetime worth of love and hopes and dreams into what you think is only gonna be, you know, a couple weeks to six months. Also, there was just a like supernatural calm and peace once we came to terms with the fact that you know this was our life um, I felt like it was just my place to be his mom and he was happy he was smiling you know he was cooing he was he was a baby um, all I knew to do was love him and you know as a mom you're just given that gift like you just love your kids so taking all the medical stuff out of it and just trying to love him as much as possible. For me, the struggle was trying to um, go from a, a place of having a, a new son and feeling a connection that um, I was just told, don't get connected, right? Like, this kid's not gonna make it to a year, certainly not to two years, you know, 18 months, whatever it was. Um, in my head and in my heart, I'm having the struggle of how do I, how do I not just fall to pieces when we lose this kid? Because that was where we were going. We were going to lose Micah. So trying to disconnect, it was an awful struggle. And I had to rely only on God and knowing that he had some kind of plan through all of it that he would show me how to be a dad to this kid. The initial accident, the result of the initial accident, I had seven different breaks, um, six in my arms and one in my foot. And as they fixed those, they put pins and screws in both arms, they also cast my left foot. They didn't realize that I had actually broken my right foot when I was pushing on the brake. I pushed on the brake so hard that when the impact broke my right foot. Basically I was incapacitated. I had both arms that had cast on the inside with the plates and screws. I had my left leg in a boot and my right foot was broken. Over three years I've had, I don't know, maybe like nine surgeries. <laughs> it seemed like surgery after surgery, like it seemed like every couple months I was having surgery again. So that was really hard. That was exhausting and it felt like it was never going to end. I, I have a lot of weakness in my arms, which is, is tough. There's so much joy in my story. I don't want to cry while I'm telling it. I have a lot of weakness in my arms. I have pain in my wrists. I can't swing. The, the pulling of, you know, when you're swinging, um, I don't have the strength to do that. Shopping was really difficult. I remember the first time I went shopping after, after the surgeries and I picked up a pound of butter picked up a pound of butter and I dropped it. And I thought, how am I going to do anything if I can't even hold butter? And it took about a year and a half before I could pour milk out of a gallon of milk. It was a silly celebration that I could pour milk. I do enjoy playing the piano. I've played the piano for years and, and I, I get to again. So I'm very thankful for that. I can't play the way I used to. Um, I can't play for a long time. My arms just get too tired. But I still get to play. Jesus' story continues in Matthew chapter 21. It says, When Jesus returned to the temple... And he began teaching. The leading priests and the elders came up to him. They demanded, by what authority are you doing all of these things? Who gave you the right? I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven or was it merely human? They talked it over among themselves. If, if we say that it was from heaven... 
he'll ask us, why didn't we believe John? But, but if we say that it was merely human, we'll be mobbed by the people because they believe John was a prophet. So they finally reply, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Have you ever questioned why God didn't meet your expectation? You know, like your hope, your plan, your, your design for your life, for the road trip you were taking down whatever season of life you were on, all of that suddenly completely falls apart. Everything around you is shattered. Your hope is gone. You're confused. You go to God and you ask him, why didn't you meet my expectation? You ever do that? And then just to feel like God responds back to you by saying, I'm not going to tell you. Jesus was simply not the Savior that these people were expecting. He did not meet their hope and expectation. And he continues as the story goes on to really challenge a lot of their expectations and their perspectives. So much so that the, the confusion they felt, the anger they felt turned and grew into hate. In Matthew 21, 46, it says they wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. And as you read through the next five chapters of the story, we see Jesus continue to go in on the Jewish leaders pretty hard. And what you notice is that for all of the going after the Jewish leaders, he never once goes after the Roman oppressors that they thought he was going to overthrow. And some of the people were amazed, but many among the crowds had their heart turned against Jesus, even though just a few days ago they were worshiping him at the praise party. And that hate that was there, it grew and grew and grew until eventually we see this. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, as you know, Passover begins in just two days and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At that same time, the leading priests and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas, the high priest, plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. See, when the Jews saw that the hope that they had expected didn't come out to be the way that they planned, th th when it turned into pain, when it turned into confusion, they turned on God. And the amazing thing is that Jesus saw all of this coming, and he wasn't surprised, he wasn't worried, he knew it was going to happen just like this. And the hate continued to grow until eventually even one of Jesus' closest friends turns on him. It says then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests and he asked them, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. The question we have to answer today and the question we want you to reflect on over the next few moments is, how can we find hope in God in the middle of our pain? When life itself seems like it's turned its back on you, are you going to turn on God as well? Or can you find a way to trust him through the pain? Would you stand with us? We're going to continue to worship this morning. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed to 
I was angry. The, like the first thing that came over me was just a, a flood of anger. Um, not even, not even sadness at, at that that moment. Um, I I left the hospital. I walked out of out of the uh, the ICU. I left her there with Micah and the doctors, and I, I went on a walk. And I was steaming, and I was angry at God, and I was. Uh, giving them the what fors, you know, is why why are you doing this to us? What 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 did I ever do to, to have this come my way? I was 
raised in a church, I felt like I played by the rules. I did all the right stuff. Tried to tried to love on on everybody that came into my life, and and this is what I got. And I just I wasn't okay with it. Walking around the uh, walking around the block and um, get to a place in front of some houses, and I look down, and in the sidewalk written in like two foot tall letters all the way across the sidewalk. It says Devo. Um, that's a nickname that I've had since I was a couple days old. Felt some hands on my shoulders and all the air came out of my lungs and I couldn't talk anymore and it was, it, it was God saying, kid, shut up and, and it's just uh, have a seat and let's talk about this a little bit. Explain to me that, that, you know, he did not do this to me. told me that that you know we live we live in a, a dark dying world and and the words that I heard were unfortunately son this is part of it like I was sitting on the curb with my dad having having something explained to me in in just being quiet and listening to to God explaining that and that that there's a there's a purpose and a plan in, in everything that that he allows to happen. He's he's still watching over it. Um, he he said that you know I, I promise you if you'll let me, I'll use this for some good stuff. And he absolutely has. I can't tell you how many how many people have come into our lives through this thing and how many how many lives we've been able to touch. But the thing that, that really struck me was the last thing he said before this conversation ended was, you know, I need you, I need you to get back in there. And I need you to go and be the man that I made you to be. From the very beginning when I asked God which way I should go, and I really felt that he said to turn left, which meant that I had to take the path that I took, I resigned myself to the fact that that was his will and and it was going to be okay because I know that he would not forsake me and even though it was very very difficult and it was for all of the reasons the hardest time in my life I knew that God was not going to leave me there and he had a bigger picture and and I just had to be assured that he was going to share that with me in his time and choose joy in the midst of it and that was my decision from the moment I was stuck in the car till till today and I'll just keep, keep choosing that because I, there's no other option like that if God's in control he's in control and you have to let him be in control I, I remember thinking all the questions you know what is my family gonna do what are my kids gonna do my daughter was a year and a half old she was still in diapers I was getting ready to potty train her you know how do you do that when you can't lift her up I couldn't What's my husband going to do? He has to work and take care of the family. How is he going to do that? But I knew that God had that all taken care of. He was going to restore me, even if it wasn't in the way that I thought or I expected. He would. He was faithful to restore, and he has been. I had been um, a very ambitious, like success, success-driven person, results-driven, um, very, very focused on achieving things and and had had a very materialistic view of of our world going through that with with her and, and Micah and Joe and and just seeing what what's what in the world none of that it, it just didn't matter anymore like I didn't give it a second thought it was like everything was was ripped away and I got a, a new chance to lay a new foundation and move forward you know with with a focus on God and what his plan was for my life from that, from that new start. I wasn't processing really well. I wasn't dealing with things. I was just doing, doing what needed to be done. Um, I was doing like a therapies. I was taking care of him, um, doing all of the medical stuff and, you know, researching and trying to figure this all out. Um, there came a point where I realized that Going through the motions each day wasn't living a fulfilling life. Um, 
God had a plan for Micah, God had a plan for me and Dawn, and God had a plan for Joseph, and just getting through morning tonight wasn't what he had a plan, what his plan was for us. There was a point where I can remember just falling on my face on Micah's floor in his bedroom and just sobbing and just telling God, like, I don't know who I am anymore, I don't know what my purpose is anymore, and um, from then on, it was more about, okay, God, I'm having a hard time in this moment. How can we go forward and enjoy? You know, he was six months old, so each day needed to be what a six month old does. You know, we played, we laughed, we watched TV, we listened to music, we ran around the house. Um, and it was in those moments that it was able like, to forget all the illness, all the machines, all the bad stuff and just enjoy being a family, enjoy being brothers, and just loving our life that God gave us. We, we, I lost my car obviously in the accident and um, we weren't able to get a, another car for quite a while. And when we did, I looked at the license plate and it was 4MPU388. And as soon as I looked at it, God said, for my praise ultimately, Psalm 38.8. So I was, I just knew that was gonna be encouragement and I was so excited, like, oh my gosh, you know, well, first of all, God spoke to me through a license plate. Second of all, he's giving me a word of encouragement. He gave me a scripture that I can like hang on to. So I couldn't wait to get home and look it up. And um, <laughs> when I did, Psalm 38.8 basically says, uh, I am bitterly crushed. I am broken. I am in anguish. And I sat and I cried and then I sat and I laughed and I thought, it is all for his praise. For, for my praise ultimately were you crushed. So I have to take that as, as a mandate to share that, that it's for his praise. And I can't complain. And you know, if I'm if I'm walking in his will, he's going to be faithful to me. So why what do I have to complain about? It's for his praise. I just got a new truck and God's just he's blessed us so much. And um, we we got the license plates last week. And we've been waiting, we got it in January, so we've been waiting and waiting for these license plates. And I've asked him several times, like, please make it a good license plate. Like, what are you gonna tell me through this license plate? And I opened the envelope, I pulled it out, and I just, I had to laugh again because Psalm 38.8 is in my license plate again. So it's just further proof. God loves me, he's gonna take care of me. And my story is my story, whether it's good or bad. You know, I'm walking in his will, I'm fulfilling his goal for me, and ultimately he gets the praise. Um, so life today and our outlook on it and then just the joy that God has allowed us to experience through everything, it's, it looks very different than it did, than it did, you know, what is it, 10 years ago now. Um, so initially we were told at six months old, don't expect him to hit a year. Definitely you will not see a second birthday. Um, Mike is going to turn 11 in June. There's a, a combination of things that... Um, Doctors are smart people, they don't know everything, right? Um, they don't dictate what God's gonna do with our lives. I always thought Micah's disease was stupid. Um, like, when you boil it down, it's a missing protein. And we synthesize proteins all the time, right? Um, God gave us the ability to do that a long time ago. So, um, in our feeble little minds, it was just, God, help us keep Micah alive long enough for you to advance what they're doing in this field to catch up and for him to be a part of you know the, the treatment that they're eventually going to find and, you know clinical trials and seeing the the results that they were getting and watching that kind of progress that's been exciting um i still pray for the day and hope for the day and believe that any time god could snap his fingers and say hey great job you guys um mike is fine now That would be pretty amazing. Um, but if that's not 
not the way he chooses to, to do it. Um, we're watching things progress that give us hope that, you know, um, I've always said that if one day Micah could wrap his arms around me and give me a hug, that's all I want. And I don't think that is real far off at this point. I think in the midst of hardship and trial, you can choose to be bitter or you can choose to bless others through it. And there was a point where I had to just decide, well, if I'm gonna trust him, I'm gonna trust him. I think in, in the midst of really hard things, everybody gets to that point where they want to place blame. And I would just encourage anyone who is there to allow God to take that. He's big enough to take that. I would tell anybody going through anything to choose joy. It makes it so much easier. Just choose joy because it's worth it. It's worth it in the end. And God's made it to glory. I know every everybody struggles are relative to their own circumstances in their lives, but you gotta suck it up. You just have to accept it that that's that's the path God has you on in your journey right now. What are you gonna do? Um, you can you can pull away and and mope about it and let the rest of your life crumble around whatever the circumstance is or you can accept it and say let's let's rise up and and let's meet this challenge you know god's behind you he will not take us through anything that he doesn't prepare us for and so if you just trust that that he's already made a way to get through it you'll find a way to get through it and i would say find someone i mean there's a congregation full of people um, for me, personal relationships, deep, meaningful relationships have been what have carried us through. And even just the people, random people saying, I've been praying for Micah. You know, every prayer that goes out for Micah is one whisper to God, you know, keep this kid around, he's great. Um, so find someone, anyone that you feel like you can talk to and pray with. John 13, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved the disciples during his ministry on earth, and, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. Jesus knew that his death was coming quickly. He even knew that Judas would betray and that Peter would deny. And yet again, we see Jesus doing something unexpected. So he got up from the table. He took off his robe. He wrapped a towel around his waist. He poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't now understand what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested. You will never, ever wash my feet. Watch Jesus' response. He says, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. This is the love of Jesus for his friends. Here was Jesus 
in the middle of this deeply broken, chaotic moment. And yet his response was to serve his friends, even with the betrayer in the room. He never fought back. He, he just performed an act of cleansing. Foot washing is a lowly, filthy job. It's disgusting, especially for people walking in sandals for miles and miles and miles and miles. It's disgusting. Rachel and Don and Chelsea didn't understand the moment that they had found themselves just thrown into. But what they did find was Jesus meeting them as a friend to wash their lives and their hearts, to comfort them in their mess and their pain. As you walk through your own pain and your own brokenness, do you know that Jesus is with you now? He's here to love, to wash, to comfort, to heal your heart. Palm Sunday, this day that we celebrate, Palm Sunday is a reminder that even though there is pain in the dark nights of our lives, joy is promised to come in the morning. But that's a story for next week. Over the next few moments, consider your story today. Where you've experienced pain, would you be able to see Jesus offer you peace? Where your expectations haven't been met. Can you choose to trust him anyway? Jesus will never, not for a second, pretend that your pain and your confusion is not real. He's with you in it. He wants to meet you in your pain. He wants to wash your feet, to bring you peace and to comfort your heart. You see, Jesus is the same God who promised Joshua, I will never leave you or forsake you, and then sent him to conquer the promised land where there was going to be fights and even death. Jesus is the same God that David wrote about in the 23rd Psalm, which includes this statement of trust and faith. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. So where are you in your journey today? Are you at the praise party? Celebrating because everything is great right now? You're right in the middle of the presence of God and you're just right here for all of it. Throwing down your life to give Jesus the highest praise? Or are you at the Passover? Needing Jesus to come in and meet you in your confused moment. And wash your feet because your journey has been so hard. Or maybe you're like Judas, hanging out with the Pharisees, asking for other options. Not because you're a bad person, but because your hope has been crushed. And you feel like at some point, for some reason, Jesus has let you down. Where are you today? Wherever you are, Jesus is there with you. He's ready to remind you of his presence. He's ready to serve you with his love. And he's ready to welcome you into his peace. Reflect on the words of Jesus to his friend Peter as we sing one more song together today. As Peter refuted Jesus' desire to wash his feet, Jesus looked at him with love in his eyes. Knowing that his friend had no idea what was going on in this moment, he looks at him with all the love of a savior and a friend, and he says, Peter, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Let's worship one more time together. Oh, yeah. 
Come on, I know you want to pray. Just a little bit after the dinner that we were talking about, stay right where you're at. Jesus says to his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know where I'm going. Thomas said, no, we don't, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. And then he adds, this is, this is really, really important. He says, no one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would, have, you would have already known who my Father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. His name is Jesus, the one who makes the perfect promise and will always keep every single promise. Amen? We shared with you three stories today. The story of our friend Rachel, our friends Don and Chelsea, and the story of Jesus. But really all of this is designed to ask you about your story. You're the fourth story. And Jesus is going to meet you right where you're at while he's also preparing a place for you. You see, he's that good that he can be a way to prepare a place for you and simultaneously be here to meet you in your story. So where are you today in your story? Do you need to put your hope back in Jesus? Do you need to confess that you, like I have been, are angry at God for where you are, where you're at in your story? Or that you, like I have done, need to come back to God and say, I don't understand a thing you're doing, but today I choose to trust you. You know, there are some moments in your life that are gonna be so confusing and convoluted and painful that it literally will be only the love of God in heaven that can sustain you through the dark night. And if you're here on a Palm Sunday and we're getting ready to have a big praise party next Sunday for Easter and we're so excited to celebrate the resurrection but everything feels like the death today, we came to tell you today that Jesus is alive. And Jesus is alive, and he is a promise keeper. Wherever you're at right now, standing or sitting or wherever you're at right now, if there's a place in your heart where you would say, Jesus, these stories that I've heard today have impacted me, and I need to make a decision today. If you need to make a decision today, you have never in your life ever put your faith in Jesus. You heard him say, I will prepare a place for you, but I am the only way to get there. If you have never in your life put your faith in Jesus, and today is the day where you would say, you know what, I am hurting, but I need to put my faith in Jesus today for the first time, and you would say, that's me, would you put a hand up above your head and say, you know what, today is the day. I'm gonna put my faith in Jesus today. Praise God, praise, praise the Lord, come on. Come on, let's celebrate. Now, maybe, maybe you're a little confused. Maybe you feel more like Judas than Jesus today. Maybe you feel like Peter going, 
What are you doing, Lord? And something about what you've heard today, you'd say, you know what? I finally get it. Jesus is with me in my pain. Being a Christian doesn't mean all my pain goes away. It means that Jesus is with me through it so I can get to the other side. And if that's you today on this Palm Sunday, would you give God some praise and just put your hands in the air and say, Jesus, today was for me. Today was for me. I worship you because today I needed to hear you say that you love me and you're with me. God, would you wash my feet today? Would you meet me and, and love me today? And for all of you with your hands up today, I just would say to you that you are loved beyond anything you could understand. That Jesus loves you beyond anything that you can understand. And your brokenness and your situation and your struggle might not miraculously, magically disappear and be resolved by the time you walk out of this building. But you know what is promised? That you will never have to walk again for another second alone. Because you are loved beyond anything that you could understand. God, I pray for the hands that went up. That we would have the courage and the peace to stop waiting for your hands to fix our problems. And that you would show us to put our hands to our problems with your love. And show us how to serve and how to work and how to endure and how to find peace how to put our hands to your word, how to put our hands to prayer, how to lift our hands in praise in the middle of the brokenness. Because I know that your thoughts for me are good. Can you just say that to him today? Can you say, God, I know your thoughts for me are good. Your thoughts, your plans for me are good. I know. You hold my future and my life church, we say three people worship. You lift your hands and join the praise party for the God who is with you in your pain, the God who is with you in your dream, the God who is serving you today. Come out and join the praise party today. You hold my future and my
and we have one more to show you, and you don't want to miss this one, so have a seat, take a look. Church, you just heard a powerful story about the Marshall's journey. This whole month, we've got a unique opportunity to support this family. Check out this video to find out more. Micah has taught me that of all the things that we we place importance on in our lives that really love. Love is what, what outweighs all of it. There are so many ways to describe Micah. If I had to pick a few, I would say he is ornery and strong and funny. He's very opinionated. He's silly and he's awfully ornery. The three things that I like about Micah are he's funny, he's silly, and he's pretty ornery. <laughs> he absolutely loves any Disney Pixar movie or the zoos or aquariums, anything visual. He absolutely loves uh, being read to, watching movies goofing off. Micah has taught me that he is capable of doing anything that he would like to do. He is an amazing kid. He really is an amazing kid. This is our Micah. At Go Shot Love, we do amazing things for families with kids on rare medical journeys. Each month, we shout love for families through the sale of creative apparel inspired by the kiddos. This month's Love Makes Waves t-shirt design is inspired by the power of love and action on display through Micah, his family, and his crew of friends that shout love for him. Visit our website at goshout.love to support this awesome family through the purchase of a t-shirt, mug, hat, or more. Each purchase in April will go towards purchasing a chill-out chair, which is a high-grade, comfortable chair that is perfect for Micah's needs. services at 9 and 11. It's going to be an awesome time celebrating Easter with you. Make sure you're inviting friends and family. We'll see you next time.